Hi, I'm Michelle Ford, and today I'm going to talk to you about unions, politics, and policy in Indonesia. The story of political labor's rise and fall tells us something not just about the Indonesian context, but about unions and politics more generally. After just over a decade of freedom of association in Indonesia, the unions had managed to insert themselves firmly in the political arena. Indeed, such was their success that government responded in an uncharacteristically effective way to undercut their political influence. Policy, especially on wages, but also on issues like social security, is a really important part of this story of Labor's political rise and fall. First, let me give you some context. As many of you would be aware, Indonesia transitioned to democracy in 1998 after over 30 years of the Suharto dictatorship. There were enormous changes in the political realm, but its political economy remained dominated by a network of political and economic elites from the past. And although unions were far more dynamic, the labor movement remained small and divided with low workplace power and no links to political parties. So given these unfavorable circumstances, how did the labor movement succeed in creating space for working class interests in the political arena? This is a very complicated story, but one that has four major components. First, learning from its experiences of the Sahado period, the unions exerted mobilizational power in the streets to influence policy. In doing so, it also leveraged new opportunity structures to secure massive wage rises in industrial regions. Based on this momentum, it then convinced candidates running for executive office, particularly at the local level, but also nationally, to sign up to programmatic demands. And then finally, having had some success in this realm, it attempted to gain representation in legislatures without tying union candidates to a particular party. There are four key background issues that I think you need to understand. The first are the historical legacies of the Sahato period. The second are the changes in the political and industrial relations institutions that took place from 98. The third is unions' tactical creativity in responding to these new opportunities. And the fourth is the role of networks and alliances, particularly at the local, but also at the national level. The most important historical legacies, um, as far as this story is concerned, include the destruction of the left in 1965 um, in the transition to the new order government, the subsequent depolitization, politicization of society. Um, most political parties was, were disbanded or forced to merge into two, uh, one which represented Islamic interests and the other everyone else. A third political vehicle of the government was called Golkar, and of course it dominated politics through the new order period. Related to this was the destruction of links between parties and unions, which had been very strong in the pre-Sahato era. And related to this is the introduction of an ideology of economic unionism, which really emphasised the role of unions by, for and of the workers, uh, drawing an artificially strong divide between intellectuals and workers, um, but also bringing in the sense that unions really should uh, maintain, um, confine their demands to the economic realm. And finally, having done so, uh, the New Order introduced an exclusionary corporatist structure in the early 1970s, which forced all the remaining unions into a single state un sanctioned union, which was much more interested in controlling workers than representing them. So what happened after 1998? Uh, first and foremost, there are enormous changes in Indonesia's political institutions, which saw the re-empowerment of the national legislature and in doing so created more opportunities for policy advocacy by unions and other civil society organisations, but also the political decentralisation of Indonesia to the district and city level. And here new local legislatures were established and provisions were also made for the direct election of district heads. In the industrial relations realm, we saw not only the introduction of freedom of association, but subsequently a rapid growth in the number of unions, uh, including a number of quite large, powerful unions that broke away from the old state sanctioned union. We also saw the decentralization of minimum wage setting processes to the district and city level, which provided unions with incentives to build local networks, but also to engage with local power holders in ways they had never considered before. In responding to these opportunities, unions had success in the wage arena, arena and policy issues, which pushed them to be more ambitious politically. Uh, importantly, though, we must note that this political engagement was iterative. It wasn't an immediate success. Um, unions very much learnt from experience to hone their approach over time. And it's, it's that honing of the approach that I'll speak to today. The other important element was the role of networks and alliances, both at the local and the national level. At the local level, these networks and alliances really underpinned union successes. 
They also underpin the success of the Universal Social Security campaign nationally and went some way to compensate for low structural and workplace power of unions. But, and this is really important, the networks and alliances were much less effective in the political arena than they were on economic policies like wages and social security. So well, how does the wage struggle become so important? Well, first and foremost, we know that for union members around the world, wages are a really important issue. But this was also about the new opportunities that decentralisation brought. With decentralisation, new local wage councils were formed, and these were really fundamental in the rise of labour politically from 2005 to 2015. Uh, Unions were on the councils along with um, representatives of employers and government. And although they weren't in the majority, they had an opportunity to influence government officials, uh, largely by staging repeat, repeated large scale protests, which forced local governments to back workers over employers in the wage councils. This was to enormous effect in many industrial regions, leading up to wage rises of up to 50% in some districts. And as you can see from this graph, um, we really do have again in momentum with some initial experiments in Batam, leading to huge wage rises, not only around Jakarta and in Batam, but also in other centres like Medan in North Sumatra. You'll note though, that this quickly tapered off again after its peak in 2013. Before we get to why it tapered off, let's turn our attention to the relationship between wage struggles and programmatic politics. And this is where local elections come in. Political and uh, provincial and local executives really mattered for unions because they had now had the power to sign off on minimum wage recommendations, oversee the implementation of industrial relations frameworks set at the national level, and also to pressure local legislatures to pass pro or anti-worker bylaws. And as we can see from this table, which I'm not going to go through in detail, these Unions in different areas, in the four of our five different field sites, really engaged quite systematically and repeatedly with local executives over time. In the beginning, in 2005 in Batam, you can see that unions, and this was the old state-sanctioned union, uh, relied on very traditional union tactics of seeking patronage from people in power, which in fact was delivered. They got a new office out of it and some other benefits, which started a conversation in Bata more generally about how unions could engage. Um, and from 2006, you saw other unions, um, including the metal workers, FSPME, starting to engage not just around patronage, but also for looking for input to policy, um, delivering pro-worker regulations, um, and getting union supported people into advisory committees for the executive. Uh, these experiments were mirrored to some extent, a greater or lesser extent, in Bakasi and Tangerang, which are industrial zones to the west and east of Jakarta, and Grosik, which is an industrial zone near, um, near Surabaya, which is Indonesia's second biggest city in East Java. And in all cases, you can see that while there was some engagement with patronage, um, there was very much programmatic demands on the table. And these are very important in the Indonesian context because Indonesian politics is anything but programmatic. It's characterised generally by celebrity, by identity politics, um, very seldom by um, policy. The red example here, the district head race of Bekasi, is different because here unions didn't just work with political parties, it actually ran a candidate itself. Um, the only other case it did this was in Medan, which is not um, an example I'm talking about today. So what happened in Bekasi? Here, Obon Tabroni, who's a very prominent activist within the Middle Workers Federation and who had been very engaged in the um, 214 electoral campaigns, decided to run for district head. This is a really big challenge in Indonesia. Um, districts have a lot of voters. Um, they're very, even in industrial centres, they're still very diverse with a lot of people who aren't tied directly to labour. Um, and although it's the only place that uh, candidates can run independently of a political party, the effort of doing so is enormous without the, um, the resources that political parties bring. And it was especially difficult for a Labor candidate because although the metal workers are a relatively well-resourced union, uh, they don't have the sort of resources that most of the sorts of people who run for office in Indonesia have. And the key takeaways from Obon's campaign, which he lost, 
was the sophistication of the campaign, which targeted workers and their families, of course, but also other constituencies. And also his relative success. He may not have won, but he received, he secured over 200,000 votes and placed third. And this was a remarkable effort in the Indonesian context. But it wasn't all about district heads. Um, these experiments in terms of executive races really led the unions to start thinking about how they could get direct representation in the legislatures that made the dis policy decisions about labour. This also has a long trajectory of engagement, which actually precedes um, the engagement with the district heads, but um, came to a head more slowly. Um, the, the interesting thing too about this trajectory is it didn't start with the unions, it actually started with parties that began approaching union figures around the 2004 election because they wanted to secure the worker vote. Um, although parties from across the political spectrum engaged in this way, the one that really stood out was PKS, which is an Islamist party, um, which reached agreements formally with SPN, which is a major union in the textile and garment sector, and with the metal workers informally for the 2009 election. It's no surprise that PKS was the union that emerged, the party that emerged in this respect. Uh, it's very different from many, most other Indonesian parties insofar that it's very much grassroots driven. It's a cadre party. Um, and it also has a much stronger link to policy, to programmatic politics, than most of the other parties do. There's also a strong Islamist bent within certain industries in Indonesia, and the metal workers are one. So the PKS approaches to unions were also um, attached to engagement with workers directly through mosques in the industrial zone. But with the metal workers, which is the main story I'm here to tell you about today, in 2009, that that engagement was quite sporadic and it wasn't particularly institutional because the metal workers, like other, most other unions at the time, had, had a constitution that did not allow them to engage formally in electoral politics. Uh, this started actually in Batam, not with PKS, but with um, a number of other parties that the local union was engaging with um, because it felt like Batam, a free trade zone, was a place where workers really had a chance of getting some results. This piqued the interest of the national executive who were firstly affronted by it, but then started to engage. And in fact, the president, Said Iqbal, ran for PKS um, for the national legislature in 2009 in the electorate that includes Batam. He didn't win, but he actually came quite close to winning um, given the circumstances involved. He certainly won a majority in the free trade zone. It was more about his access to the other small islands that meant that he didn't succeed. But based on these experiments, the union then engaged as a federation even more directly in 2014. And interestingly, in 2019, the following election, it was joined by other unions in the confederation who really started to believe that unions did have a role in electoral politics. So let's look a bit more closely at the metal workers' legislative strategy. As I mentioned before, Batam led the way in 2009 but working with several different parties. There was also something of a campaign in Tangerang, the industrial zone to the west of Jakarta, but FSBME, the metal workers, are not particularly strong there. Bekasi, which really is um, FSBME's heartland and the place where Obon Tabroni is based, didn't actually engage in 2009 because it was suspicious of the national strategy and really sat back and just watched. But having observed the experience of, experiments of 2009, in 2014, the, the union decided to ditch its anti-politics stance and engage directly as a union. Um, it had been rather burnt by PKS in the 2009 election, so it decided to field candidates for as many parties as possible. This was a highly orchestrated and well-resourced campaign. It didn't succeed in Batam because of internal issues within the branch, but the union really punched its weight above its weight, even in Tangerang, and it ran nine candidates in Bakasi, seven of which for local um, legislatures and two of those were elected for different parties. So in 2009, we see the strategy uh, quite adjusted quite dramatically, partly because in the meantime, the metal workers had supported Prabowo, the military candidate for the 2014 presidential election. And I'll return to that story later. So as a result of the fallout for that, um, the metal workers decided to pursue politics by the Confederation, KSPI, or in English, the Confederation of Indonesian Trade Unions, rather than directly through the Federation. 
There were also changes in electoral rules, which meant the presidential election now coincided with the, the legislative elections. And this required a very different strategy. And it was really very interesting how this evolved. So basically what the union did was in areas where polling showed that Prabowo was strong, they brought together and they, they ran candidates for his party and they brought the two campaigns together. In other areas where they were running candidates for other parties, they simply didn't mention the presidential elections. So the long and short of this is that Obon was actually elected in Bakasi for the national legislature and there was one other uh, person elected in Batam. Like the two candidates who were elected in Bakasi in 2014, these candidates stood out from other union candidates, union members who had been elected on a party ticket, because these really were there to represent the union's interest. So in that sense, it was successful in the sense that there was proof of concept. Uh, it wasn't very successful in the sense that of all the electorates, the industrial electorates in Indonesia, they only managed to elect two. But what's, what is interesting is the awareness of union candidates in Bekasi, where the union really mobilised in 2014. And as you can see from this grant, uh, graph, if we compare to 2009, where Bekasi uh, middle workers didn't um, mobilise, there was far higher rec recognition of union candidates with almost 80% of metal workers members in Bekasi 1 district, uh, recognising the names, being able to um, recite the names of union candidates. Uh, even this had a spillover effect too for other unions and non-union candidates. So you can see that in that same district, which was the district in which the union campaigned most strongly, other unionists and non-unionised workers also had a 50% recognition rate of unionist names. So this political story led to an interesting backlash, um, not my, primarily not because of this legislative story, but because um, the metal workers and the and KSPI had fallen in behind Prabowo in the 2014 presidential election. And uh, in a similar fashion to the graph I just showed you, uh, there was a really bump for Prabowo in the electorates where the metal workers campaigned hard, up to 20% in some of the areas in Bekasi. Cognizant of this, and the election was very close, when elected Jokowi really moved very quickly to contain the unions. It did, he did this in a number of ways. First, he rewarded the union leaders, the leaders of two of the other confederations who had supported him in the election. And he even tried to bring Iqbal into the fold. But underneath that, there was really a strong return to Suharto era tactics for controlling labor, uh, militarization of control of labor protests, um, the intelligence services all around the place on labour, threats to individual labour labor activists and so on. There are also some policy changes that were very important. The first of these was that Jokowi extended the um, vital object status, which had been introduced by Megawati as an anti-terrorism um, initiative, to a number, a really large number of industrial parks and factories. And what this meant was it really limited unions' ability to protest in those industrial parks and factories, and that, of course, under cuts its industrial influence. The other thing, and this was even perhaps more important, was that it introduced government regulation number 78, 2015, which eliminated the role of the local wage councils as bargaining arenas, bringing in a formula based on inflation and productivity that really meant that there was very little room for unions to influence wage outcomes. This was increased, um, added, to the injury under COVID when the government introduced and passed an omnibus law. Um, this law was really wide ranging. It ranged from everything from tax to environmental provisions, but its main spirit as the chair of the Employers Association said was labor reform. And basically despite initially promising to engage with unions more um, and after unions walk, union walkouts and large scale protests, the um, law was signed on the 2nd of November. And this law really affected unions' capacity to engage as an institution, as well as number of conditions for workers. So what we see from 2015 is a breaking of the nexus between policy and politics. The reconfiguration of the wage councils and the enforcement of the minimum wage formula really undercut unions' capacity to shape wages policy. But the implications of these measures were much broader. First and foremost, they severed the ties between politics and policy at the local level because unions could no longer mobilise in the same way around wages to force local district heads to engage with them politically. 
In doing so, this really has seriously limited unions' capacity to engage politically at all. 